The filler content of Genial Universal Injectable, which is mm, the material of choice for me now, is 69%. This is actually higher than some of the composite pastes out there. So I'm not going to say that it is stronger, but the myth of flowables are weak is a myth. Wait, ha hang on a minute. You're, you're going to use flowable composite and you're going to squirt it inside a, a clear stent and then, and then you're going to expect that to hold up when it's restoring anterior tooth wear? Have I, have I got that right? This is exactly what I thought when I first came across this technique, but you have to understand something that is not regular old flowable composite. And there are some micro details to gaining predictability, which is exactly why I've got Dr. Kostas Karajanopoulos. Kostas, I'm so sorry if I perverse your surname there. Uh, he is a phenomenal dentist based in the UK. He's a fantastic restorative dentist and he teaches on this technique. So who better to talk about this technique than Kostas? He's gonna go through the entire workflow from case assessment to see who is suitable for injection molding composites to how to execute it and some key gems to take away so if you were to do it Monday morning you're gonna gain a lot from this episode uh, the protrusive dental pearl before we go straight into this really cool episode is the following right so many of you are placing uh, let's say lithium disilicate on lathes right the problem is when you get them back from the lab on the model they they fall off really easily or when you put them on the tooth to try it in, like there's no resistance form. There's a real lack of resistance form on these onlays. Therefore, they just fall over the place. So if you have a composite core in place, I'm a big fan of getting the biggest, fattest diamond burr you have, which is round or spherical in shape, and just sinking it in until you get this kind. And if those of you watching right now, I'll describe it if you're listening. It's like, it's like a, you see like a, a semicircle or a, a half sphere drilled into the composite. And what this does is that the, the ceramic will now have this extension of this half sphere into it so that now it's less likely to fall off the model and way less likely tr to fall off when you're trying it in. Now, it's debatable whether this actually improves the resistance form of the restoration. Technically, anything that opposes your uh, finger removing a crown improves the resistance form, so technically it does, uh, but you do it for just convenience, really, and as long as you're drilling into core material and you're not sacrificing healthy tooth structure, then I think this is a great little technique tip. So I hope you followed along there, so use a big fat round burr, sink it into your core and allow your um, ceramic to extend into that uh, to help your onlays stay on when you're trying them in. So let's join Dr. Kostas and I'll catch you in the outro guys. Kostas Karajnopoulos, welcome to the Producers Dental Podcast. How are you my friend? I knew amazed I said it correctly. <laughs> I think. <laughs> You, you did it very well, naturally, with, a, with an accent as well. Perfect. <laughs> I, used to, I used to work with a few uh, Greek dentists, uh, so I, I, I always made an effort, you see. Uh, that you are, of course, Greek, right? I haven't, complete or, I haven't completely messed that one up, have I? As Greek as it gets. Okay, amazing, amazing. Well, uh, listen, you're someone who has been on my radar for a, a few years now. Uh, our mutual friend, uh, Ricky, told me about you some time ago. And what Ricky said, and he's been on the podcast as well, he did a whole episode on, on productivity with a prosthodontist. Lovely guy. And he said some things about you like, Jazz, you need to speak to Kostas. You have a lot of sort of similar philosophies. Uh, and what he admired about you, Kostas, and I don't know if he told you this or not, but what he admired about you was, you're working in um, a hospital setting, you're teaching, you're performing, you're also uh, in wet fingered practice and in Richmond until, uh, as well. And then as well as that, you're, you haven't fallen into a trap of, of falling into like a very narrow mindset because he felt as though he saw something in you and the fact that you actually have, have training from the USA and you, and you do things a little bit more open-mindedly is, is the best way that he described it. What do you have to say to that? And then also, for the good listeners, can you please introduce yourself? Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of a mutual feeling. Um, I'm going to talk about you first before I talk about myself because I kind of bumped into one of your um, little videos and um, there's this expression that we all know it sounds Greek to me. And uh, I said, hang on a second, that guy speaks the same language like me. There's one more person in this planet that, that kind of uh, speaks Greek. So um, <laughs> it's kind of, okay, you've got an occlusion background. I'm a prosthodontist. I did a lot of training in the U.S. with uh, an ethologist and an educator called Frank Spear. I followed the, um, the British Society of Occlusal Studies about 10 years ago, doing equilibration on kind of uh, patients. So um, I 
was looking for this kind of terminology, this kind of workflow. So I really liked what I heard. And um, only last week, I kind of gave a, a, a lecture to my students here at Guys, my postgrads, about selection of splints. And I said, you know what? You just need to go online and do that course. I know you're paying a lot of money for your MCLIN dent, but go and do that. He's better than me. So um, <laughs> You're very sweet. Thank you so much. Coming on to me, yeah, my name is Costa. I'm, um, I'm a prosthodontist. I work here at Guys where I'm speaking from at the moment. I'm a consultant in the postgraduate center. I look after the training specialist, so it's purely in an educational role. Um, that's one day a week, but otherwise I'm in specialist practice kind of four days a week in Essex and St. Albans. Um, I do have indeed quite a mixture of things. I, if somebody told me, hey, you're going to be um, in, in, in practice five, six days a week, that's kind of too much. This is like teeth are rattling in your head. Um, or you're going to be in hospital full time. That is a kind of a different kind of mindset. Um, and I've never really had that. So I like having a, a bit of a mixture of the two. But then again, I do all my training and all my CPD kind of abroad. Now it's a little bit tricky with, with, with COVID. Um, but I've been all around the world to kind of um, uh, gather some uh, information. Um, as far as today's topic, it, it kind of the inspiration came from um, teaching people like Ricky about four or five years ago. We have a toothwear clinic here at Guy's and uh, we treat a lot of tooth, erosion, attrition, the lot. And we're doing the full workup of um, photographs, wax ups, face bows. And when we actually got to treatment, which usually is resin composites as a first line of management, we were not using any of this. So we were spending quite a few weeks on the diagnosis, on the small design, and then we were going freehand. And I said, hang on a second, there's got to be something different than that. Now, freehand is difficult to teach. There's people in this country and other countries which are excellent at this, but it is difficult to teach. And um, it is difficult to execute, let alone teach, in order of consistency. Because if you're doing a big case, by the time you hit the canines or the premolars, kind of your, your eyes are fright up. So, so true. Um, I, I had to think of ways to cheat, replicate, mm -hmm. copy-paste. And I've been doing this for five years now. And I've, and, and, and I've kind of used every single way um, possible. And um, I've kind of narrowed it down to the technique that I use these days and I teach which is the injection molding technique um, in collaboration with GC. Amazing. Well, well, that's exactly what the episode is about today. Uh, injection molding uh, for composite restorations and the, the, you know, the why, the when, the how, the longevity, all these nitty gritty details, which I think, uh, as we were discussing before, like, you always get the, the classic questions, the same questions over and over again. It's time to, to let it all out. And, and, and no longer shall people ask you these questions because they will listen to this podcast and they'll know all the answers. So I'm going to hit you with the number one, like your origin story of why you needed this kind of a uh, way to treat patients makes sense because to go freehand is, is, is very uh, technique sensitive. It's very time consuming. I love the fact that you also mentioned that, yes, we get tired. It's true. Our eyes get tired and the canines are not easy to treat, uh, easy teeth to actually get anatomically correct, by the way. So by the time you get to the canines and then things are looking out of place, spot on. When it came to injectable composites, a lot of dentists who haven't used this technique before, or maybe have never even considered using this technique before, will have some natural reservations. They're thinking, wait, flowable? That's not strong enough. That's the first thing they could come up with. So did you have similar reservations, or did you have some evidence to go by uh, initially to think that, okay, this thing, we think that this has a future, this has some legs. So w was it a bit of a punt, or was it based on some pre-existing data? Good point. Um, let me start by saying that clinical kind of evidence in terms of uh, peer-reviewed and uh, meta-analysis and systematic reviews are not there, okay? I've been kind of looking for them. They're not there. I'm going to be making a clinical study here at Guys, but that will take a few years to make. So there's quite a bit of in vitro uh, data, um, which is very promising. How did my... Um, let's say, flowable journey start. It was about six years ago when I went to Geneva. One of my mentors in composites is Didier Dishi, and he has his own oh, composite 
um, um, called Inspiro, um, a big proportion of which is on Flobal. So there was six um, Flobal dentins and, and four enamels. And they kind of transformed the way I do things because they had this thixotropic property that you shape it on a marginal ridge and it kind of stays there. So I said, hang on a second, let's research this. Now, the filler content of his product is 69%. The filler content of Genial Universal Injectable, which is mm, the material of choice for me now, is 69%. This is actually higher than some of the composite pastes out there. So um, I'm not going to say that it is stronger, but the myth of flowables are weak is a myth. Um, so they are hugely kind of reinforced these days. But they do have the, the stereotype that, ooh, I'm going to do my resin coating with this. It's just going to be as a base of a cavity and it's going to be a stress breaker. And I'm putting this on the incisor ledge. So I didn't have the evidence, but if um, um, I hear to DVD issue telling me that, hey, I, I put Flobble on my incisor ledges, that's pretty good enough evidence for me because he's been doing it for 35 years. So um, I have my own evidence. I've been using them for six years. And um, the failures that I have seen um, are not, in my opinion, related to the um, material itself. It's more down to, to the technique and ability to bond and ability to etch the way that you would like. Um, so the, the, the properties of the materials are definitely there. The clinical studies will definitely come very soon. They have all already come out for class fives and class twos, but nothing in the kind of um, load bearing areas. So um, it's, it's a matter of time before they do. The benefit that you have by using an injectable or a flowable composite is first of all the, um, the, the ability to replicate anatomy, anatomy determined by a lab technician. They are better than us. And um, of course, the ability to kind of conform to a specific um, shape determined by a, a, a clear stent. So that's that's the benefit that you get. Um, you kind of copy paste an already verified design rather than rely on being on a good mood and being consistent between Wednesday afternoon and Monday morning, which I cannot be consistent. Very well said. And those of you watching on the video, uh, Kostas was waving uh, one of the stent examples, which I which I love to see. The origin story, going back to your origin story of, of trying to plan these uh, perhaps wear cases or full mouth cases and, and trying to do like an interim period. Uh, and that's where you thought, OK, there's got to be something quicker than spending hours and hours doing you know, paste composite freehand. Do you see the role of injectable composites as a transition? I, I mean... In honesty, all restorations are transitional. We know that already. I mean, you can appreciate yep. that, that nothing lasts forever. So, you know, in a way, even all these composite veneers we see on Instagram, they're transitional. They're going to need, you know, uh, who knows what's going to happen three, four years' time when it's been yes. you know, 10 years since these composite. Are they all going to go to ceramic? Are they going to be recycled composite? We don't know. But essentially, the question to you is, when you do it, is your intention that, hey, if I can get the occlusal scheme set up here, this is going to be my definitives for some length of time? Or are these just long-term provisionals to test the occluding scheme? What is your mindset when you're placing these restorations? I'm, I'm a little bit biased. Um, I have two kind of main principles in my head which determine how I approach a case. First of all, um, uh, the, the toothwear cases, they're going to be presenting with 30, 40, 50% damage. The last thing that I want to do on these teeth is take them down more. So um, I want to avoid crowns. So I'm, I'm, I'm already leaving this as, as, as a last resort. So my default approach is going to be additive, adhesive, dentistry. Now, the second thing that um, influences my opinion is that all the studies that have looked at tooth wear, they're very cumulative. So they put all the diseases in one bag, erosion and attrition, and it's like they're different, all right? Okay, sometimes you're going to have um, a bit of a grinder who's got a bit of reflux and a little bit of both. But on many occasions, you're going to have Pure attrition, flat as a pancake, and pure erosion, craters big as, big, big, bigger than the moon. So I'm going to approach the erosive cases purely in additive composite resin. There's not a single facet in that patient's mouth. Um, even for the pure braxis, the neurological braxis, let's say, 
Um, mm. Yes, I'm going to do a little bit of a build-up to crowns because I want to refine my occlusal scheme and the force distribution and my localized kind of um, group functions in resin mm. rather than in temporary crown material without double charging the patient because I don't see the point of, of, of going for composites and then going for crowns because you kind of d- double charge somebody. So, yes, I do believe a lot in adhesive dentistry. I do consent appropriately for this, that, hey, um, this is a long-term kind of measure. But like with all composites, I mean, injectable composites are no different to any composites. They they are going to chip, they're going to stain, they're going to break, they're going to look matte, and longevity is um, somewhere in the region of about four to five years. So... Nothing different to the normal composites that we do. Now, they are high maintenance, and if somebody is not happy with this, they're going to have to take the hit and have the teeth cut down for, for on laser crowns. But I want to avoid this as a first line of management. I mean, I love what you said there because it, it touches on the whole thing about functional risk, right? Like, uh, I think uh, Kois talks about in Spear, they talk about, you know, functional risk. I don't like that term that much, personally, because I think it's parafunctional risk. I don't think it's functional risk because, you know, if, in function, our teeth shouldn't be touching at all anyway. That's, uh, that's, that's my, the way I see the world. But anyway, let's go with the functional risk thing. And you're right. I'd much rather confidently treat that erosive case uh, than that purely attritive case. It's just more going on. And like you said, you have to almost over-engineer that attritive case. So I see what you say there in terms of when someone's main etiology of destruction has been purely attritive, you, you know in your mind already that, okay, this is more of a transition. But when it's purely erosive without, as you said, any web sets, you might get a uh, longer time there, but it's still composite at the end of the day. So what I want to know from you now, Costas, is you've been doing this five, six years. Are you yet to recycle one of your ones that you've uh, placed five years ago? How are they looking uh, now? Because I see them, you know, what I admire about you is you're posting your cases uh, on your social media um, to instill confidence in dentists and patients using this technique. And I've seen a few of these um, follow-ups uh, o- over some years, and, and including in private practice. So Give us an update. How is it looking and how much maintenance did it take? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question that actually patients ask, that, hey, you're doing a six-unit case or an eight-unit case, and kind of the minute you tell them that, hey, this is going to be about five years, they think on the, on the, on, on the anniversary they're going to find eight bo- bits of composite by the pillow. Like, they're, they're all going to come, <laughs> come out together. So what I tell them is that, no, I mean, um, we're going to come to the annual maintenance, but at some point that maintenance becomes so frequent that it's just better and easier and makes more sense to just go all in. in instead of getting a handyman, just getting the builders. Um, so on, on, a, on a consent process, I let them know that, hey, um, we're doing this additive approach. We're not cutting your teeth. La la la, but um, you're going to have to come once a year, and I will need to polish this. And when I do your checkup, and I'm take your X-rays, I'm going to take a little bit of a disc. Um, so I will find kind of um, proximal staining, and uh, this is twofold. Firstly, because our polishing and our finishing is not as meticulous on the on the embrasures proximally as it is on the facial. Um, and secondly, the, the patient's oral hygiene, cleaning, flossing, or lack of, will lead to some staining in there. So you're going to see a little bit of a halo. Thankfully, a little bit of disking and some kind of um, spiral silicones are good enough to maintain this. So um, if people know about things, they are kind of okay. Otherwise, they can kind of complain. So I, at the beginning, maybe my consent process wasn't great, but now I let them know that, hey, once a year, We're going to do kind of a maintenance um, kind of thingy. It's going to cost a few hundred pounds. um, And you have to put that into the kind of budget of things. I haven't had any catastrophic failures. Um, And um, as I said, I don't really blame the material. I always blame myself. So I'm going to, if if I get some kind of uh, distal of laterals breaking off, I'm going to blame my occlusal control because we, we, we don't kind of eat and grind from the inside outwards, but it's, it, it's the opposite. So I spend a lot of time, at least on the attrition patients, to check kind of all the eccentric movements. Um, so if anything, I will blame my etching, I will blame my hybridization, and I will blame my occlusal control, um, not the material. So. Coming on to the negatives of this injection molding technique, it does have some, 
Um, let me start, start with the contraindications. If you're making tiny additions, it doesn't work. Mind you, mm -hmm. if you're making tiny additions freehand, it doesn't work, but that's a different subject. You, you need to have a certain volume, and about a millimeter incisally is kind of the cutoff point. Mm -hmm. um, another contraindication is kind of having black triangles and, and not adding facially or incisively. You, 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 like a clear stent like these is not going to help you get in there. So you need something like um, bioclear or, or other kind of freehand techniques. So there are some, the, the main contraindication for injection molding is the single tooth. So um, doing a layered polychromatic buildup with incisal effects and a little bit of opalescence and all of that. Forget it. You've got to get your, 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 your whatever system you use, like dentin enamel, and go um, lay it. So this technique is not here to substitute layer, it's here to complement it. Um, so the main indications for injection molding are kind of toothware cases, the aesthetically driven patient who um, has kind of uh, small teeth and they need a little bit of a smile lift and uh, just aesthetic changes. Um, um, and and uh, these are the kind of the main indications. Now, in terms of problems, it is a technique where you kind of placing a composite tip through this tent and you're injecting mm -hmm. the material. The material has the consistency kind of, of flowable. It's it's not running, but it's uh, compressible. It is is like um, you can squirt it out. You don't need to heat it up. Let's say so. Mm -hmm. There is a possibility that you're going to get voids. So, a good analogy is like you know when you're making your your, your pro temps or your looks at temp crowns, you always have voids. You just don't know that you do. So there's always a void in there. So um, I've come up with all sorts of ways to uh, minimize or um, avoid this. So one in ten cases, I will get some a bit of air trapping, and un unfortunately, that air trapping is going to happen from the vent where you're injecting from, which is incisally. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it can lead to a bit of staining or, or a fracture. So there are um, uh, kind of ways to compress this. So the clear stent is made pressurized. It's not just a, a bench made kind of stent. It's made in a hydro flask, in a pressure pot, so that it fully polymerizes. So the adaptation of this material called ExaClear, which is a clear silicon from GC, is outstanding. It will even replicate printing lines on the composite made from a digital model. So mm -hmm. there's no problems with this. The concept is to have this thick enough, it needs to be about a centimeter facially, a centimeter palately, and a centimeter incisally to be rigid enough. So mm -hmm. it basically, acts as a stop for the injectable composite, the silicon is compressing the composite. So, um, and I'm using this now to compare it to some other techniques which are using restorative paste, heat it up. Um, I believe that if you're using a restorative composite, heat it up to 60, 70 degrees or whatever, the, the paste wants to displace the stent. Whereas mm -hmm. here, yep. the stent is determining the show. It's the, it's the other. It's the other way around. So yep. um, there is no way that a flowable composite is going to displace this. This is rock solid. I'm trying to to kind of uh, bend it back or lingually, and I can't. Have you thought about Costas that with that uh, stent made of Exaclear in a pressurized format to supplement it with a, an Essex retainer on top? To, or is that just not necessary? Is that something that you've tried? It is something that I've tried. Um, let me tell you about the alternatives to this technique because I wasn't the only idiot who, who, who had this problem. So other, other, other people had this uh, kind of issue of like, how can we copy paste? Um, not going freehand. So back in 2015, the index technique came out from uh, Ricardo Amanato and Federico Ferraris. It's basically um, kind of um, the, the same concept like this, but individual teeth. So you, you slice up the, the, the stent like a sushi roll and you kind of do it on an individual tooth so that you don't have to mess with the cleanup. So you clean up each tooth and you go along. Um, that works well for mild to moderate tooth wear because you have quite a bit of referencing from the tooth underneath, but not for severe wear. So um, uh, the DDD issues technique describes exactly what you said. is is an SX retainer, relined 
with clear silicon to pick up the detail, but the SX gives it the rigidity. So mm -hmm. the problem with this is that you're kind of having to make holes through two things and um, you need to kind of drill the holes and that creates a little bit of dust. And oh, I've been there. It's very annoying. I, I usually delegate that to my nurse with a micro brush. Be like, just <laughs> you know, half an hour, just get it clean. It's very annoying. So the, the people that um, I've learned this technique from, I mean, the person that came up with this technique is Terry Douglas out, out of, the, of the States from, I mean, in the early... Hilarious days. guy. Hilarious guy and, and really Absolutely. great with ceramics and material Absolutely. toys. Um, so he, he describes kind of cutting holes with a tungsten burr. I just didn't like the dust because I was leaving it, it was kind of within the matrix and it was look, looking messy. So um, what I'm using is the actual tips of the composite. You might be able to see the, the, the vents over here um, to, to, to make an equal kind of uh, diameter hole. Hey guys, hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. If you want to download an infographic on step-by-step, -step, like visual aid on how to carry out this technique, then go to www.protrusive.co.uk forward slash Injection. If you just type in injection, it'll take you straight to the page you need where you can download this infographic and PDF. It's like a visual aid, like an aid memoir of all the steps involved. Hope you enjoy and back to Costas. It's a technique that kind of works, but uh, but it, it can have its kind of limitations. Um, it's designed for monoshade, let's put it this way. It's not mm. designed for, for layering. So it can allow for layering, but it's it's uh, it's it's a hundred percent monoshade technique, which makes it popular for for toothwear cases, and for makes it popular in Essex where you are. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th there are different ways to kind of go about it, like the the Essex retainer and stuff. But um, in my personal opinion, this is the most rigid. I mean, the thickness of this makes it super rigid. So I have to hold this firmly in place and I need my nurse's assistant to, 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 to kind of inject. One problem that it doesn't solve but it minimizes is the cleanup. So um, I'm getting some excess uh, but less I believe than other techniques. So the equipment that I need to finish a case are a 12 number blade, a very sharp curved blade and some IPR proximal strips. I don't need to use burrs or discs. The anatomy is already there for me. Mm -hmm. If I use burrs and discs, I'm going to destroy what the lab did. Perfect. Well, I'm just, uh, in my mind, I'm trying to uh, position myself as, I'm trying to remember when I used to do uh, this technique, uh, and uh, we could talk about some other techniques as well, similar to this, and I want to eventually come on to your workflow, your one minute workflow, like you know, step by step by step, because that's what dentists are hungry for. But uh, I'm just remembering some of these times I've done it, and. I used to get sometimes this uh, air void, not just where the channel was, but uh, in the mesial incisal corner and in the distal incisal corner. So then what I started to do was preload the stent in the mesial incisal, incisal corner and the distal incisal corner. And the few times, I haven't got enough cases to be able to say, hey, this, this works. Um, is that an issue that you've had? Uh, and, and do you, basically my question is, do you preload the stent a little bit as well as injecting from the hole or is it purely injection from the hole only? It's, um, let me put it this way, if there is um, any other exit other than the one where the material is coming from, the material will be uh, under compression, it will be within like a lot of hydrostatic pressure. So um, I do make sure that there is no kind of escape channels. Um, and um, I will be getting some voids occasionally when I'm retracting the syringe vertically. So I'll get some incisal kind of voids, but not what you mentioned, because I ensure that laterally and gingerly, I have um, stops, I, I, I have a frame within, I, I'm, I'm com compressing the material. So I can actually visually see through that stand because it's completely clear, some of its competitors are not clear, um, so any voids will actually be visible. Um, so I've never had it within the material, just upon pulling out. So and it's, and you're purely just injecting. You're not preloading the stent with any um, of no, that injection. No, no, I don't. I mean, I've never seen the the need for this. Sure. Um, I 
do like seeing the material being injected and then gradually filling it up as if it's about to overflow on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, on a glass or whatever. So I like it. It's ever so satisfying seeing that. <laughs> but then if you overdo it, you, you, you expect some flush. So um, the flush management out of all the techniques that I've tried is by far the best. So you're going to have a very crisp junction between the composite that you need and the composite which is kind of um, excess on the cervical. And then you put a knife between them and that breaks off. So there is some cleaning up. Um, this technique is not designed to do multiple teeth together. So it relies on, uh, on little blankets, on, on PTFE tapes and the alternate tooth technique. So you can either do one tooth at a time, but um, that is quite slow. So the fastest you can go is uh, doing three teeth together, canine, central, and- Other lateral. Yep, the other lateral. Um, and, and then coming back for the other three. So it is giving you kind of some speed, um, but then again, um, and coming on to the workflow, it has um, more appointments and a higher cost than freehand. So when I'm pricing things up for my patients, it is more costly than freehand because you have multiple appointments, you have a lab fee, you have to make stents. So let me now go through how I approach this case. Somebody comes to me and they say- Before, before I get, because I'm, I'm, I'm so excited here for you to just to, you know, geek out and, and tell me workflow, because um, it reminds me of when I used to do this uh, uh, as well, and I probably just haven't had the, the cases through to discuss this, but also I have recently been moved to a, a paste system. Uh, you know, let's just be honest, it's the elephant in the room, SmileFast. I have been using SmileFast. Let's get it out there, okay? My, I'm Jazz and I use SmileFast, okay? Uh, don't shoot me. <laughs> so uh, now that I've moved to, to that kind of system, uh, it has its own challenges. It has its own challenges. So I'm sort of experimenting with at the moment, but no doubt, uh, I think I'm gonna. I do miss when I did uh, injectable injectable technique, and when I've got one or two more cases of smile fast on my belt, I'll be able to really then pick and choose between the, the two different techniques and tell you maybe a few years later which one I prefer. Yeah. But definitely um, the flash that I found with with, with the smile fast system was a bit, but it's quite quick to manage. With the I mean, the best thing that you said uh, there were, uh, about all the lovely things that you know, I remember using is the every other tooth technique. That is a real gem right there. Uh, and by, by doing that, the downside is that you need two stents, right? You need one every other tooth model and stent and one full smile stent. And that's where the higher lab fee comes. Uh, have, I, have I got that right? Well, correct. I mean, one way to do it is, um, is on the digital workflow. You have a six unit wax up. You ask the technician to, 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 to click the mouse three times and delete the alternate teeth. Yep. Then you have like, a, it's like, a, it's like a, 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 a up and down because one tooth is going to be longer than the other. So three wax ups have been removed and the other three remain and they make a stent based on that. So um, I don't routinely use this technique. I actually just get one made, but I create some stoppers for the ones which are not to be bonded um, mm -hmm. and I do this with my kind of um, mock-up technique to, to prevent the injectable from flowing laterally. So um, if you're doing an analog wax up, it's very difficult to remove conventional wax and make uh, a stent for three and then for six. So um, there are different ways to go about it. And after, um, as I was telling my delegates in the course that I did on Saturday, you got to do five cases and in these five cases, you've done all your mistakes. It is like, um, I'm 100% sure about this. So there are mm -hmm. a few mistakes to be made. And um, the alternate tooth technique works. Um, you can't do all the teeth together. Other techniques like SmileFast are aiming at doing multiple teeth. I am not interested in doing multiple teeth. It might be an excellent technique, but um, I don't want to do multiple teeth. I don't want to do fast dentistry. Um, so, um, one big benefit in the technique that I do is that I am in control and that comes to the workflow. I am not working with a central lab. The lab that makes my stent is my own lab. It's no fancy central lab which only works on, on scans and not alginates and they kind of um, do one case after the other. So I, I don't rely on any kind of specific brand. 
um, it's down down to me and my usual lab communication. I mean, I WhatsApp my lab technicians all the time, regardless. Now, if that's one more reason, he, he must hate you, man, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and love you. It's a love hate relationship, I'm sure. <laughs> my wife might do because I text them more than I text her. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me walk you through my typical case. A sequence, please do. So William came yesterday. Lovely guy. He he's got a little bit of rotation. He's got a little bit of microdontia. He is not going to benefit from Invisalign because he will still need some restorative work. So he says, okay, everyone's talking about composite bonding. You're the man. Go ahead and do it. So I will take a full set of photographs. I will take um, scans of his teeth on my intraoral scanner. And um, I will send all this to the lab prescribing a wax up as if I am going for ceramics. So. This whole concept is basically using the whole build-up as if you're going for crowns or veneers, but then in the in the nick of time you just whoop, you kind of turn and you go for composites. So you, you don't have the teeth. Um, so my lab prescription to um, for, for, for the wax up is going to be the following. The first thing that I tell them is that is this an additive wax up or subtracting? If it's an additive, you can mock it up. You're just adding volume. Typically, 90% of wax ups are going to be purely additive. If you have teeth which are massively rotated and there's a, the distal kind of corner is coming out, the lab will need to remove some before they wax. In that case, you cannot do an additive mock-up. The second thing that I tell the lab is um, do they conform to the occlusion or not? So if it's an aesthetically driven case, it's going to be an, an MIT case, ICP, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, if, if it's a, a, a toothway case, they're going to be opening up the vertical. I will tell them that, hey, open up the, the incisal pin or the virtual incisal pin by two millimeters and separate the posteriors like a dull concept. So mm -hmm. occlusion, conforming or, or, or changing. Mm -hmm. Then onto the aesthetic principles, um, is the incisal plane correct? Because if you give a dental model to a lab, they haven't got a clue. They need the photographs. They need the photographs, and especially the portrait picture. So some information on incisal plane, some information on the midline, Typically, you're going to be increasing length, and if mm -hmm. I don't want to increase length, I will find one tooth which has the correct length, and I will tell them, hey, use that upper right one to design the smile, just like complete dentures, nothing, nothing mm -hmm. different. Reference tooth. Absolutely. Then, uh, as far as the facial addition, which is a pretty common thing that people want, they want broader, bigger smiles, um, I will kind of give them an indication of where I want them to add. And I will take my little kind of pencil on my iPad and I will make some lines and I will send these across. So basically I'm giving a lot of information to the lab. Oh, the last thing I'm going to ask the lab to do is, is what stents I want them to make. So I do not use this clear stent to do a mock-up with. I make a separate one, just patty and wash. Why? Because this is going to get dirty. I don't want it to get dirty. Mm -hmm. So I want it to be super clean for the day of the, of the, of, of the injectables. So I'm giving them a long text, a long email, which you might think, well, if, if, if I do this in a, one of the competitor techniques, all I have to do is kind of send them off and they do it for me. Well, I'm, I'm a little bit of a control freak. Good. I want to design the smile. I want to let people know, yes, the experienced labs will know how to do this for you. And if somebody comes out of dental school, they might not know how to prescribe kind of these lines and whether the midline is canted and all of these things. So. I want to be in control. So the lab will then send me a wax up. Um, I prefer a hybrid wax up. So it's a printed model with a handmade wax up on top mm -hmm. rather than a fully digital one. Because the detail that you get on a manual wax up on an analog one, in my opinion, is better than the one you're going to get on digital. Um, the live is purely for the purpose of the, of the mock up, right? That you're getting this uh, hand wax up. Yeah, it, it is purely for the purpose of the mock-up, but then again, um, nine out of ten mock-ups that I do are fully approved, and they become the kind of um, blueprint for the clear silicone stand. So I will rarely modify the wax-ups because... The, process, the, the, in, the Indian in me it can't resist but say that the lab bill is increasing here, man. Like, if nine out of ten are approving it, bite the bullet, go to the digital. That's, that's the Indian in me, like, yeah, come on, save that lab. <laughs> what do you mean? What's the benefit of uh, um, going digital? The, the benefit is because uh, that, uh, so the final one where you go to every other tooth model and the, and the full set model, the full set model, 
the design, the model is all there. Like he can pretty much send you, he doesn't have to print the every other tooth model yet because it's not been approved yet, but he can just send you that model that, and, and make you a, a putty wash on that for you to transfer into the patient's mouth is, is my thought. And that's the way I've done it because I, wanted to, I, I didn't want to do two wax ups. The, the only limitation of the full digital workflow is that the primary, the secondary anatomy, the tertiary anatomy within a central incisor, the lobes and the grooves and the perichemata is not as well defined as a well crafted manual. For sure, for sure. That's the only sure. limitation. But, um, you you I, guys I, can sense, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the control freak in Costas, the, you know, the, the attention to detail, which is very <laughs> admirable. And you definitely see that shine through in the social media. But, so but, do check but, but, but in terms of the workflow, you're absolutely right. The digital is kind of the future when the tooth libraries are that good, um, like, um, like Hayito's kind of uh, tooth library from the anteriors. If, if you use that kind of stuff, you can get excellent, excellent anatomy. But um, I still prefer like a, a handmade wax. Oh, I respect that. I, I can see why. And I think you're going for the, the, you know, the cutting edge, the finest of the fine. And that, that's, that's awesome. So um, I will then fabricate myself a patty and wash stent as if I'm making temporary crowns. Um, I've got a little pressure pot in my clinic, so I will make that mock-up stent. It looks like this, but it's out of uh, putty and wash. And mm -hmm. I will use my Bizacryl um, to make an additive mock-up. Your favorite brand of Bizacryl is? Looks at them. Cool. Um, and and um, I will then scrutinize this. I will take pictures. I will take a video. I will show the patient. I will let them know what they like and what they don't. And as I said, nine times out of ten, it's going to be a stunner because um, the lab is pretty damn good at making these. So it comes down to the detail on the wax up. The, the wax ups are not going to be full contour. I mean, just because it's a wax up, it doesn't always have to be full contour. You're just filling in corners here and there. But basically, it's the art of working out where the teeth need to be, um, just like the, the, the prosthodontic extension work. So, Costas, can, can I ask, are you, are this case, is this case um, mounted on an articulator, i.e., is it, um, are you also dialing the function this tape, or is it purely ah, um, yes. aesthetic at this stage? Well, the, all the MIP cases, the ICP cases, uh, they're going to be kind of um, relying on the buckle bite of my trio, so my prime scan or whatever. Um, now, if I'm doing any kind of dull cases, three to three, four to four, I will um, deprogram someone on a leaf gauge and I will take some centric bites with some um, stone bite or whatever I might have. And I'll keep one kind of centric bite on one side and I will scan the buckle bite on the, on the other side. So that um, when the virtual models are kind of mounted, they are mounted in CR. Um, so, um, I will not do a face bow. I mean, the, um, the, the only uh, thing that my lab sometimes do is that they use kind of an interpapillary line to kind of do an aesthetic aspect of the face bow. Um, so, I will nevertheless take physical centric bites when I'm changing the occlusion. But I will still kind of scan the mouth, um, the back teeth are apart, the OVD is maintained by one centric bite on one other side and then swap. Um, so that, that, I mean, that's a real gem. I just want to highlight that because the times I, I, I've done that and I'm such a big fan of, of scanning the, uh, the occlusion at your desired OVD, which is determined aesthetically. Like, I'm just amazed that when I've done the injection molding or paste molding or whatever, and then I've just kept them patient to, to bite together, how little adjustments I have found I need to do. 100%. Has that, that been your finding as well? 100%. I mean, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's cheating. Uh, it's cheating. I mean, you, 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 you kind of do a big case in ceramics or composites, you focus aesthetics, aesthetics, aesthetics. You've got a couple of patients waiting, and then you ask the patient to occlude, and it's like <gasps> a disaster. So um, I, I know that this is going to be there or thereabouts. So the, the, the notion that the, regardless of how much you open them up, it, it, because it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a parabola, you, 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 you're going to be at the hinge axis. Well, that's nonsense because we're never going to find the hinge axis. So you've got to be pretty much at the right vertical, two millimeters open, which is like the thickness of a, of, of a an occlusal appliance, a B-split or whatever. So um, I will try and do this at the right vertical. It's, it's um, what percentage of cases are kind of reorganized? The small percentage is about 10% of the cases that I do. Uh, in, in private practice, because I imagine in, in hostel, it's, it's the other way around. Absolutely, the other way around, because um, in, in private practice, people come, 
requesting this on aesthetic grounds. Now, they may have a little bit of tooth wear, but it's mainly the facial. It's mainly the looks. So, um, I'm going to get referrals in practice for genuine tooth wear cases, functional cases, which need dulling or a full large or proper ortho, because dull is kind of ortho for the poor. Um, but but, 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 but in, in, in hospital, it's, it's the other way around. So here we have functional tooth wear cases where the teeth need crown lengthening or extractions. I just last week managed to get the injection molding materials approved through procurement and they're available at guides. So we're going to stop just doing um, uh, freehand right, left and center. But in practice, it's a small kind of percent of cases which are requiring centric bites, opening up the vertical, and things that might be outside of the comfort zone of uh, average GDP. Amazing. Uh, is there anything else left in the workflow there? So you've, you've told us uh, about the design, uh, how to transfer that with the, the Luxatem to the mouth. You gain your approval. We've talked about the different models you make every other tooth. Um, we've discussed a little bit about the actual uh, injection, injection molding procedure itself. The mistakes that the common mistakes, which obviously you do in your course, and I think there's too much because we've got to wrap up here now. Um, and then uh, anything different? I mean, I, it's just composite bonding, right? So I don't imagine there's too much difference. It is. Uh, just to composite and, bonding. Um, uh, I mean, in, in terms of uh, longevity studies, the, the, the technique is there's nothing special about it in terms of um, it's basically about the material. So if, if you do a class to cavity and you put your composite horizontally or, or in increments, it, it doesn't really matter. It's about the material that you use. So when we have clinical evidence about this technique, we're going to be looking at the injectable composite. So on the day of um, doing the composite, let me make this kind of clear, is, is um, uh, rubber dam. Rubber dam and injection molding are fighting against each other. Like, mm -hmm. they, 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 they don't really like each other because this wants referencing points. If I'm doing three to three, the premolars are acting as reference, the palatal tissue and the buccal tissue are acting as reference. So the few cases that I've done with proper rubber dam, not split dam or whatever, is the thickness of the dam and the stretchiness of the dam is fighting me. I don't want anything to fight me. So how do I isolate? I will use my octogates, I will put retraction cord, and I will put my Teflon tapes, which are going to be tucked into the um, papilla so that I cannot see the papilla. So I'm creating a frame, gingerly, retraction cord and the Teflon tapes on the proximal, so that I will not have any gingival cubicular fluid, tongues, cheeks. So the purists might say, this is nonsense, anything without rubber dam, and they might be right. Um, I don't know yet, but um, I do know that if I go for the full dam, um, it's, it's going to compete with the, the, the stent. Now, a split dam... It's the same for me, by the way, Costas, with class fives. Like, um, sometimes it gets in your way, rubber dam. So uh, Richard Porter taught me, you know, eight years ago, use rubber dam, always use rubber dam, except when it makes your life more difficult. Yeah. And in this case, you're, you're, it's going to be too fiddly. You're more likely to make mistakes, have the rubber dam stuck in between the stent and the tooth, these kind of issues. So I think it's actually more predictable without rubber dam in this technique. Correct. So um, for anterior restorative dentistry, um, it, it's, it's of no benefit. Now, if you're doing um, the wound and tissue and you're adding on sixes and sevens, that's a different story. So mm -hmm. um, you've got to have good isolation over there. So I'm going to aim for rubber dam and I'm going to trim that stent so that it actually sits accordingly. Oops, I just dropped it. Um, so um, posteriorly, you, you can't really control. So on the day of the injectables, I will do my isolation in whatever way. Um, if I'm in doubt about the shading, because looks at them and um, com resin composites, they don't always kind of talk to each other. So I might actually do a quick mock-up, which is the most expensive mock-up in the world of <laughs> with the actual injectable material. Um, and I will place my, my, my Teflon tapes. My nurse will have everything ready. She will cut double the number of, of the Teflon tapes that I probably need because they shred, they, they break and whatever. Um, lots of uh, number 12 blades. Um, IPR strips, the ASAP kind of um, uh, polishers, which are like idiot proof. Um, and uh, I will not really need discs and burst. Maybe if I get a little bit of a lip on the cingulum palately, 
um, uh, with, with the probe, I might feel that something, I, I might put a bird to that, but typically not. So it's, it's, a, it's a technique mainly de designed for, 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 for monoshade, but the success comes from the communication with the lab. So the, 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 um, the spotlight goes on the GC materials, ExaClear and the, the, the injectable materials. They are amazing materials. And the unsung hero, the lab technician, who is mm -hmm. chilling mm -hmm. in the bench, shaping a wax up, having a bit of coffee, looking outside, doing exactly what I would do if I were to do freehand. Now, there's lots of people, as I said at the beginning, who are excellent at freehand, and they teach it very well. But um, I want a, an easy technique, and I also want an easy technique to teach, um, which the, this technique, I think, is easy to teach. Um, freehand is not so easy technique. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, I, I like the fact that it, it improves the relationship with the uh, lab technician. It's like short-term orthodontics. It's like it, it massively improved your, your relationship with the orthodontist where, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. rather than undermining it. Um, and um, I think there's a big future for this technique in terms of copying anatomy. And, um, okay, you might not have incisal effects, but most people don't really look for this anyway. Very true. Uh, Kostas, thanks so much for that. Absolute. I'm going to call this a injectable composite mastercast. I've never used that word for mastercast. Can't use mastercast. It's a mastercast. Uh, just give us a real decent, juicy flavor of, of this technique. Um, it's something that a technique that I actually enjoyed using when I used it. I've got a few cases that I put online in the past, uh, and I look forward to you know using this technique again because uh, I'm a big fan of the of the uh, GC um, Universal Flow, the injectable one, the gold one. Is, is that the one you used, right? Correct. It's it's the, the universal injectable is yes. kind of the the, the, the sequel to the, uh, the universal the flow. It's, it's pretty much the same material, um, better silenization and a better tip, a better yeah. tip. Yeah, I just love using that because you know, as you said, you can you can actually place it and and it will not slump or move, and it's you know it's, it's got all the properties you want from flowable, but also it's a highly filled uh, resin. So uh, that's amazing. Um, Please, please, please tell us, where can we catch your courses? Are they only in England, London, GC? Where are they? Uh, is there anything that you do abroad? Because you have quite an international audience here. Tell us. Yes. I mean, um, I, I've started this collaboration with GC. I love their materials. I love the ethos of the company. And um, I'm going to be doing these hands-on courses in Milton Keynes in their kind of uh, HQ. And um, I've planned quite a few from now till Christmas. They're going to be on Saturdays. If you email uh, GC UK, they will kind of uh, give you the details. Um, so send me that as well, any brochure. I'll, I'll stick it on the on the website. We'll call this episode um, protrusive.co.uk forward slash uh, injection composites. Not injectable, because you might spell that wrong. Injection composites. Uh, and then on there, I'm going to have all these details. So I want the GC email to, uh, to to get on there, any posters, that kind of stuff. I, I mean, I saw the feedback uh, on social media recently. Uh, it was phenomenal. Everyone loved it. And I can see why. You're, you're such a great educator. I can you know. pay somebody 50 pounds, they'll, they'll say very good things for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, Please tell us some more. Sorry, we, I, I stopped you in your tracks. But, but uh, I'm going to be doing some in Ireland. So I've, I've planned kind of... Uh, Cork, Dublin, and, and, and Belfast for, for the autumn. And um, it's kind of, uh, it's going to start going up north um, towards kind of Newcastle and, and, and Glasgow. So um, I would like to do a little bit of a roadshow because it is a fantastic technique. Um, I don't want to kind of steal the, 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 the spotlight. As I said, it's about the technician and it's about the material. So um, I do this in call up with GC kind of one Saturday a month. And it's a full kind of seven day, uh, um, seven day, seven hour course, like a full day course. And I've got four hands on exercises, kind of a single central, the peg lateral, six anterior teeth on the alternate technique, and then the wound dentition. Four, five, six, and seven. So um, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to cook. I couldn't come see your recent cohort because I was teaching in um, in Edinburgh myself, actually doing TMD splints for like one hour. So I couldn't come to that date. But um, I I want to come and see you in Dublin because I I, I really want to go to Dublin. I've never been to Dublin, so I'm going to look out for that date. Uh, can you tell us your Instagram handle so we can actually see these cases because they're, they're brilliant? So my Instagram kind of page is Costas underscore 
Karagianopoulos, my surname. By the time you get to the, the first few letters of the surname, it should come up because it's such a ridiculous <laughs> Good surname. luck. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a, a, a name and surname. Um, so you can drop me a private message on, on Instagram to ask anything about the courses. I'm, I'm always on the other side and I will answer questions rather than tell you, no, you've got to do my course first. So I'm not that type you know, of... Costas has been really approachable. Uh, I, I find it easy to, to speak to him. So if you have any sort of cases, ask opinion, send it to him. Uh, it's been really lovely to connect with you over the last year or so, Costas. And uh, thank you so much for making time. I know you're probably looking at the clock thinking, oh my God, I've got to go back to my clinic and my, my, my students and stuff. Thank you so much for, for giving, giving us so much value in this episode, my friend. Uh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode. You should totally check out Dr. Costas' work on Instagram. He is such a giving clinician. He's one of those people who's always sharing knowledge. And honestly, his occlusion knowledge is up there. He's a clinician I really, really uh, aspire to be like. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed that. Do check out the PDF download once again on forward slash injection. And I'll catch you in the next episode.